for all y'all to be here. <laughs> Brother Don called and asked me if I would bring a little sermonette or an epistle, small one. Um, last time I was here behind the pulpit, I spoke a little bit about um, affliction. And the two things I'd like to mention this morning, one is uh, about fasting and the other one is repentance. Um, we all sin, we all fall short, but there are some God rules uh, in his word that he's put before us to reap benefits from it so that we can know how to live a life that's in communion with the Lord. Uh, there's a few examples in, in their book about fasting. There are more examples about repentance. Um, if you'll turn with me in your Bible, if you have it, or on your PD, uh, Matthew 5, through this book, there's quite a bit that Christ gives us in the ways of rules and the way that we should live. And I uh, pray that y'all would bear with me this morning. I'm having a little bit of problems getting it out, it seems like. Um, you see that in the book before that, in, in chapter 4, it said uh, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Satan likes to hit us when we are at our most vulnerable, or what he perceives to be our most vulnerable. For Christ, it was 40 days. I don't think I could go four days uh, at fasting. So that's probably a good example of, and a comparison of how uh, Christ sees the topic and how Satan views it. Because immediately, Satan set upon him. Um, the following pages touch on uh, repentance. It says that after this time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he got the message from the Lord that it was time. To fulfill all righteousness. To achieve that, he fasted and he prayed. And of course, Christ didn't have to repent, but he gives example of that by saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We are the light of the world as his children. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto they that are in the house. So if you turn a light on, you don't go and cover it up. It also tells us that every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down. That's an example of us as Christians. If we aren't doing the Lord's will, and we make no attempt, he's going to see to it that he restricts and uh, chastens his children. That's one way that a, a Christian can know that they have salvation. It's like if you have children and one of them misbehaves on a playground with other children, you're not going to go out there and spank the other kids. You're going to go out there and take care of your child. No one else is. Well, if we are his children, he's going to spank us every once in a while. He's going to get his message across. Uh, the Lord gave an example 
a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. In this case, we are the tree. And the fruit is our good daily works that we do before the Lord. Uh, he found no fruit. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it or fertilize it. And if it bear fruit, well, if it bear, if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. And I believe this example here is showing us as the tree and our works as fruit. The Holy Spirit is the groomsman, the dresser of the vineyard. Um, if a person strays from the Lord, and, you know, there's those, uh, this topic came up Wednesday night about maybe they don't attend regularly or maybe they haven't been here in years. What should be done about that? Well, really, they're, they're just falling away, okay? You could make a big stink about it and you could cause problems. Uh, there's no good to be uh, had by shining a light on that because that's not our business. Our business is between our daily lives and the Lord. Um, we can only take care of ourselves and I can't even do a good job of that myself most of the time. So I don't have any business trying to create problems for others. But um, if a person continues that life, they may get by with it. The Lord may let them live their entire life without ever any chastisement, but probably not because each of us as Christian, the Lord is going to exact a price. If you've ever had a friend, if they were a very good friend, if I have a, a real good friend, I expect it at some time or another to cost me something in order to be their friend or for them to be mine. And I don't necessarily mean in money, but it may, may cost me something uh, out of the way that, that I need to humble myself about or that I need to go out of my way to do for them because they're my friend. Well, that's what it's saying here also. The Lord is going to expect something from his children. Okay, if you continue down that path, the Lord will afflict you. He will put some problems before you. And, you know, you may see the light, you may repent, and you may get back on the straight and narrow and worship the Lord. You may not. Some people, he takes them out. If they stray from the Lord and they rebelliously do not return to him, the, the scriptures are pretty clear that the Lord will take them out of this life. Um, it says also in chapter 5, before the light of the world scripture, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. On the following pages, chapter 6, it describes some of this meekness. The Lord doesn't want us to make a big deal out of uh, our daily life if we uh, commit a crime or commit a sin, let's say, against the Lord. Uh, the Ten Commandments being a good example. If you lie, cheat, steal, God forbid, murder, whatever, the Lord will forgive you if you ask forgiveness. Okay, but he demands repentance. And if we look at what he teaches us in order to confess our sins before him, he tells us here in chapter 6, uh, when thou do, doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. It means don't uh, necessarily tell those that are your closest about you, your friends, your relatives, what you necessarily are doing. If you're going to donate something, do it in private. I think most people would agree with that. Um, and it says, when you pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, out on the street corner, let's say, or on television, radio, 
They love to pray standing in the synagogues. Uh, you see examples of that nowadays on the internet, all of our means of communication. They're out in front with it. They're, they're praying more like they're preaching. They're not actually praying to the Lord. They're praying to their congregation. Um, they pray in synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And that's true. Now how do we, how do we achieve this, the Lord's will? Uh, we do it through prayer. We do it through living. All of us are sinners. All of his children are sinners. You present your life before the Lord and you keep uh, a good expression uh, that I've heard from elderly preacher from the old days, you'd say, you need to stay prayed up. Okay, so you mark your violations between you and the Lord every day. You take mental note because I can assure you the Lord is. At the end of the day, at some point, daily, preferably, it says to pray without ceasing. At some point, you need to tally up just like you would balance your, your bank account, let's say. You need to confess those sins before the Lord and turn away from them. And I think in America, from what I've seen in, around Lubbock anyway, uh, the people that are Christians, they're good people as far as the earth goes, the world goes. And they ask, you know, for forgiveness. They're sorry about their sins, but there's not a whole lot of repenting going on. You know, we can... Uh, ask God over and over and over to forgive us of the same sin. Some sins we're bound to, sins of the flesh. But other sins, uh, each person is different and unique in that, in that regard. But to repent is to turn away from it. And then you've got a good communication with the Lord, a good relationship. You've confessed your sins, he's forgiven you, now you've repented from them. Now you can build that relationship. Well, what do you do then? One thing people, uh, I think, that are remiss about is they're, they're good about asking maybe for things, but what are those things you're asking for? Are they godly? Are they temporal? Are they things of, for, of the hereafter? Or are they things that concern men? Like, oh, Lord, uh, let us win this football game. Or, uh, Lord, let me win the lottery, you know. You know, praying so that they'll win the lottery, let's gamble, okay? That, those are not things that you ask for. But should you have a big desire, uh, say you're buying a new house and, or a car, or may not be that big, but uh, you've got a question of the Lord. And, you know, the Lord is not in the habit of sending you a letter or an email. So how do you find out? How do you find out what the Lord's will is? Well, we have to be meek. We have to be humble and humble ourselves before the Lord. In Ezra, what he did whenever uh, Artaxerxes, the king, and his successors, whenever they released the Jews and they came back to Jerusalem, you'll see, and this is the only time I'll go back, but in Ezra 7, it says, For Ezra has had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. Okay. How did he prepare his heart? One way he did that, it says in Ezra, is that he called for a fast. Many of you here have had uh, procedures done or an operation done. They will they'll ask you to not eat. It'll be a procedure of fasting. Don't eat anything after 10 or 12 at night. They want your stomach empty. Um, some of you may not know, but the reason that they don't want you to eat anything is because if something fouls up in the procedure and you need to be operated on that's got to happen right now and they can't wait if you have something on your stomach and you aspirate that you're you're liable to breathe it into your lungs suffocate and die and then also too if they have to operate they don't like a lot of liquid so don't drink anything so those, those are good reasons uh, but as far as besides that, how many of you have a routine of fasting? I know as Americans, all of us could stand to fast a little bit. I know I can. I've, I've gained, I don't know, 
15, 25 pounds. Uh, but to fast, you're saying no to yourself. You're depriving yourself of something that is taken for granted. Okay, when you are fasted a day, two days, for sure three days, you're going to be a, a lot more humble about things. You're going to be a lot less proud. You're not going to be too anxious to cause other people a problem. You're going to be more in tune with God, more in tune with the Lord. Uh, if you fast and you want an answer to something that's been bothering you, the Lord may not choose to answer you in your time. He will answer it. It may not be something that you pick up on. But those are the procedures that are in the book that the Lord has directed us how we should live our lives, how we should conduct our relationship with him. He's faithful and just to forgive. And the reason he says just, it's not from ju a justice standpoint. It's because he's holding up his end of the bargain. That makes it just. That's where justice comes in in that thing. I don't want justice. I'm, I'm too big a sinner for that. I want mercy. Um, I appreciate y'all letting me speak just a little bit. Uh, bear those things in mind. Uh, fasting is not just a thing of the past, and it's not just a medical thing. It's something that each of us would benefit from if we practice. Try it. Try one meal. Miss it. Confess your sins before the Lord that night. The Lord will bless you for it. You'll feel better. Physically, you'll feel better the next morning if you just don't abstain from it. And the Lord will bless you for it. Thank you very much.